Turn with me to uh, John chapter 2. John chapter 2. And on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water jars set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing two or three measures each. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water jars with water. So they filled them up to the brim, and he said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And so they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the inferior wine, but, excuse me, but you have kept the good wine until now. And Jesus did this in Cana of Galilee as the beginning of his signs and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Please be seated. <clears throat> and as you do so, please turn back to Ephesians um, chapter 5. Now, we, for those of you who are joining us, we've been um, talking about drinking. Okay, And the title of the messages is Do Not Get Drunk. Um, and the question that we're trying to answer is, is it okay for a Christian to, to drink? Uh, is it a sin to drink? Should a Christian drink? What does the Bible say about wine and alcohol and all that? And one of the chapters that definitely has some, some you know, um, the mention of wine is John chapter, chapter 2. But just to make it clear, our main text is not John 2. Uh, it's Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. This comes from the admonition from verse 15. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So it's all from the, all from the agenda of, of calling the church to be wise. And here, he says, to be wise and to walk wisely before God, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, the main idea here is really not so much about wine. It's about being led by the Spirit of God and being submissive to the Spirit of God. But you'll notice that the word wine is placed there in the same sentence with the Holy Spirit. I mean, Paul could have put anything there, some other thing. You know, don't be filled with this, or don't go after the world, or do not love the world, but be filled with the Spirit of God. I mean, that would have been completely fine. But there is a reason why the Lord, to the Ephesians, put the word wine there. Okay? Why? Well, I think it's obvious. The Ephesians had a temple called Diana, and there the priests and the priestesses of that temple would offer alcohol and other, um, other drugs to induce a certain state in the mind to lose control and then to participate in all kinds of uh, occultic uh, sinful activities. And it was clear that wine in that culture, in that city, was considered to be a sign of debauchery and sin. Now, everyone loves to use this verse to say, God permits wine for Christians. Because they'll say, hey, as long as you don't get drunk, it's fine. Mark Driscoll, one of, you know, a very popular... Uh, a pastor, uh, but very disqualified, but he's still teaching, um, said, and I, I, I heard him say this, uh, he said that when a woman uh, comes to his home um, because she's like distraught and she needs counseling, 
uh, and she's just completely just like stressed out and 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 going through whatever it is, whether it's whether whether it's like a abuse at home or job or whatever. Him and his wife, you know, would sit her down, and the first thing he does is pour wine. And, and he says it like it's a good thing. And he said this um, helps her calm down. And so we all take a cup. I, you know, I, I'm not going to go into all the biblical stuff. He, he, he was, saying, he was you know, saying all this stuff like, yeah, yeah, we don't, we'll bring in the Bible soon. But let's first just calm our nerves. Now, what's interesting is that he's admitting something here. What is he admitting? That the moment you ingest alcohol chemically, it does something to your body. It has a relaxing effect. And that's exactly what Paul is saying not to do, right? Do not allow any substance to control you except who? The Holy Spirit. Did you guys understand what's going on? He's, he's admitting the, the wine is taking hold of my counseling and all of us. It's calming us down. Now we're in a state where we can what? Talk about the Bible? The, the, the text in verse 18 says it clearly. Do not get drunk with wine. In other words, don't be controlled by this substance. They all knew. Okay, I don't think they had some biology class and they looked at it microscopically and did a blood test and see the concentration of alcohol. Everyone in all culture knows what happens when you drink. Something immediately takes over. Or, let's put it this way, something immediately lets go. You start losing yourself. Um, I, I was watching the news this past week and you know, July 4th just passed... Uh, was a couple weeks ago and and one man died uh, because he lit a firecracker on top of a hat he had like a high hat you know those uh it was july 4th uh you know so the, he was wearing those you know high hats you know those what do you call those uh, the one that um you know a, yeah top hat mr uh, abraham mr abraham lincoln abraham lincoln you know you'll see him in, in those pictures so he put it on there he lit it and it literally just blew off his head and you know, I was listening to the news. And, and you know what they said? You know what they said? They said the, they were interviewing the neighbors and they said he was drunk. He was drunk. His wife kept telling him, don't do it. And he wouldn't listen. He was showing off. The moment alcohol takes over, what happens is you lose control and your sin immediately comes out. Do you guys understand? There is a restraint that we have to put on our bodies. Once you take another substance that releases that, it's just sin in whatever your body wants to do. And you've seen, it's a, you know, whether it be on movies or, or, or people in your family who got drunk, they would say and do the most you know, unthinkable thing in front of other people. And so... The people in Ephesus knew that. And Paul is saying to them, don't ever let that happen ever what? Again. Don't ever let that happen again. You are to be filled with the Spirit of God. You are to be controlled by the Spirit of God. And let's just make it clear. This disqualified pastor named Mark Driscoll, he's wrong. He's absolutely wrong. But he's, he's boasting about how loving he is. What a great counselor he is. And letting everyone know you can use wine as a tool for counseling. I mean, why not bring out the marijuana uh, uh, you know, cigarette and, and smoke that? Why not just whatever? Why not Valium? Why not more? You know what I'm saying? Where do you end? Where do you put the line in terms of you know, your counsel counseling methods here? Well, let's review, again, this idea of being filled with the Spirit before we go back to John chapter 2. First, Ephesians 5.18 should not be used to figure out if a Christian should drink or not. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. Just because but the Bible in this verse 
doesn't state clearly don't do that doesn't mean you can. Number two, the main point of Ephesians is, is, is you must not lose it in the, in the discussion about drinking. The main point is that you are to be controlled by the Spirit of God. You know what's really interesting? When you listen to these debates about drinking or not drinking, it seems like they're no longer thinking about the Holy Spirit anymore. It's just arguments. There's really no care about submitting to the Spirit of God. And number three, being filled with the Spirit is a willful moment-by-moment -moment choice. Now, this is very, very important. The, the grammatical structure of verse 18, when it says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That phrase, but be filled with the Spirit, is present imperative, okay? A per present passive imperative. Present tense meaning ongoing right now. Passive means you yield to the Spirit of God. And imperative means it is a command, meaning you must willfully, moment by moment, choose to submit to the Spirit of God. Okay? That means every single moment from the moment you wake up to when you sleep, you're seeking to yield to Him. And no, it's not easy. Okay? But it's something you have to learn to do. Every moment you're praying, Every moment you're thinking about Him, every moment you feel tempted to think about something other than God, you put it out. Okay? Every moment you're rejoicing, giving thanks, you're memorizing Scripture, you're reviewing what you've learned, you're trying to apply every single moment. That is what this text means. As we told you before, when you walk with joy, you are in the Spirit of God. When you're being submissive, look at verse 21. It says, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ, that comes from being, uh, that comes from someone who is submitting to the Holy Spirit. He's submissive to other people. He's very submissive. He's not assertive. With verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands. When wives submit to their husbands, it's an indication that they're submitting to Christ and submitting to the Spirit of God. Husbands, love your wives. When husbands exhibit love to their wives and the, and the wives can feel it and they can see it, you are being led by the Spirit of God. Okay. And, in, and from a few weeks back, uh, Ephesians 5 can be compared to Colossians 3, where the results are the same. And we realize the beginning is different. Being filled with the Spirit in Ephesians and in Galatians chapter 3, uh, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. So, so those of you who want to be filled with the Spirit of God and walk in obedience to Him should be overflowing with God's Word in your heart. Uh, that comes through listening to sermons, reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, okay, all of the above. And then after that, we went to Romans 14, and the main idea there was you should die to your own desires. He does mention drinking. He mentions anything, really. Uh, let's turn to Romans 14. And in this chapter... It was made clear that drinking alcohol is not sin in itself. Everything God created is deemed to be good. But there were two groups in this church. One group, they just couldn't eat or drink anything because they thought it was offered to idols in the temple. The other group, they were more knowledgeable. They knew that there was nothing wrong with it. And now the church was divided. So Paul tells him, look at verse 7, For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Okay. Um, Ian, can you lower the air conditioner to like 78? And if you go to chapter 15, verse 2 to 3, 
Again, it says each of us is to please his neighbor for his own good, to his building up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. So, you know, the question, can a Christian drink? Yes. Is it a sin to drink? No. Should a Christian drink? And the answer is no. Look at verse 21 in chapter 14. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. Even at that time when drinking was part of culture because of the, 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 the water and things like that. And here I, I believe he's talking about very, very strong wine. Okay, there was certain wine that was very diluted. It was, it was made for just, just drinking uh, and, and to be re, uh, replenished and hydrated. Um, but Paul is saying, whatever you want to do, always be careful that you do, not, you do not stumble someone else. And so again, look at verse 19. So then let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things are indeed clean, there it is, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Okay? So it is good not to eat meat or drink wine. All right. Now again, you know, from Romans 14, can we make the conclusion that every church member should not drink? No, not yet. As I told you before, by the time we're done with all of the study of different passages, you will be convinced that the Bible never promotes drinking. It always promotes abstinence. Okay? But again, it will never give a specific command, do not drink because alcohol is not a sin thing. Does that make sense? Now, from there, we turn to 1 Timothy 3. And remember, for elders, they uh, to be qualified as an elder, they must not be drunk uh, or addicted to wine. But we clarify that the word addicted should not be in the English translation. Uh, it's because addiction means more of like they're physically just medically or, you know, physiologically just drawn to that. Uh, the phrase in the English, um, the phrase in the Greek means someone who is next to wine, alongside wine. It's a nuance for someone who loves wine. He just loves to drink. He might not get drunk, but he's always next to alcohol. And so for a leader of the church, he must not be known for that. Timothy took that and applied it, and he went to the extent to say, I will never what? Drink. Particularly in Ephesus, where people were out to slander him. Well, he eventually got sick. And again, before we you know, criticize Timothy about you know, that, uh, he did it with the right heart. But we, we, but we also made it clear that God does not show favoritism. If you do it with the right heart, and it's still harmful, you will reap the consequences in your health. Okay? Um, and so in chapter 5, Paul commands him, like literally, no more water for you. That's literally what he says. No water for you. Okay? Stop drinking water. But use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. And we understand that to be more of like a medicinal use rather than a command. So there, Paul literally commands use a little wine, but you cannot take that and say, yes, Paul commands me to do so as well. Can you imagine if you're one of those charismatics and you're flipping to the Bible, what does God want me to do today? And you're like, oh, use a little wine, and you start drinking, okay? We understand that this text is for Timothy and Timothy only, and for the church to know that, uh, that with God's authority, uh, Paul is allowing Timothy to drink uh, for his health sake. Now let's turn to John 2. Okay. John 2. And I've heard so many sermons on John 2 with pastors in their wedding day and saying, Jesus brought wine to the wedding. We need wine at this we we uh, wedding and everyone should drink. And I would just nod my head and think this is so blasphemous. Did Jesus, through this example, make it clear to the New Testament church that, that during a wedding, there should be a celebration with wine? Now, um, for just to make it clear, for those of you in the future who are going to get married at Titus Church, or one of the elders might officiate that, 
uh, understand that if you want to have us officiate your marriage, uh, you are not allowed to bring any alcohol. Okay? Um, and there are very clear biblical reasons why we can do that. Um, there are people who have like an open bar, think, uh, things like that. Uh, we will consider that to be a very, very unwise and dishonor to God and I would say even sinful. Okay? And you cannot use John chapter 2. So let's just read it again briefly. We read it in the beginning. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in, the Can wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and the wine ran out. And the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, <laughs> what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water jars set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing two or three measures each. Jesus said to them, fill the water jars with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And the reason for that is so that no one would think they put something else in it. It was clear to everyone it was just water. Remember, the water changed to wine when? Sometime after they drew it out, and as they were walking toward the head waiter. Because the, the, the waiters, they would have looked at that and think, what a miracle. But notice none of them claimed that. They did not know what happened. They just took, they just took water straight to the, uh, the head waiter. And when he drank it, it turned into wine. Um. And so they didn't, he did not know where it came from. The servants who had drawn the water knew. The head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the inferior wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. Again, what does that mean? It means they're trying to deceive their, their guest. You bring out the good wine, and after everyone drinks a little, and then eventually their taste buds get used to that, and so you just bring out more diluted wine. And no one would think anything less of you. It was just... The custom at that time but he was surprised that this wine tasted much better because jesus created it but notice interestingly enough none of the people in the wedding followed jesus christ only the disciples believed look at verse 11 jesus did this in cana of galilee as the beginning of his signs this was the first major miracle he did nobody followed him because the miracle really was not for the purpose of them. It was mainly for his disciples. It says the disciples saw his glory or Jesus manifested his glory to them and his disciples believed. Okay, so let's kind of go through this. Um, third day there was a wedding uh, in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there and they, it says here they were invited now, this gives us an insight to Mary. It's really interesting. Uh, Mary um, was a like a socialite. Okay? She was very involved with the people in that area. Someone had a wedding and she was on it. She's going to help them prepare. She's going to you know, do all this preparation. And we know that because when the wine ran out, what did she do? She tried to do something about it. Um, and so the, the mom obviously invited his, her son and also all of his disciples because she was part of the wedding preparation um, committee. Now, verse 3 to 4, When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Now, when the wine runs out in a wedding celebration at that time, uh, it's a very embarrassing thing for the family. Uh, Lenski says this, and I quote, the impression left by the entire narrative is that the present wedding, perhaps the couple was poor, lasted only one evening, and was celebrated only by one feast, made as fine as possible by the means of the groom. Remember, the weddings at that time would last days. Money would be poured into food, and people would just, I mean, I don't even understand how that even works. You celebrate, you go home, go to sleep, come back, hey, let's... Celebrate again, and, and more food and more, uh, more wine. Uh, Lenski says this, the phrase began to fail. It, it means it was declining. It was, it was about to be discovered that there's going to be no more wine. 
so it wasn't gone completely yet. It was getting to that point of 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 of, of a minimal a minimal amount. Robertson says this was an embarrassing circumstance, especially to Mary, because she's part of the wedding. What you know, <laughs> organization there. Okay. Uh, which is interesting because I never thought about that. You know, that Mary might have been a little bit embarrassed. Like, what just happened? We, I thought we had enough. And suddenly everybody, you know, maybe more people came than they should. Okay. And MacArthur says this, such an embarrassing faux pas could have stigmatized the couple and their families for the rest of their lives. It could even have left the groom and his family open to a lawsuit by the bride's family for failing to meet their responsibilities. So this was a huge, huge deal. Um, this is like in a Korean wedding, if you do not serve lunch, like they will eat you up, okay? Yeah, because they're there for, uh, for the food, believe it or not. Well, I'm talking about the older generation, the, uh, the older, older ones, okay? Now, <clears throat> one of the questions that comes out is, did Mary expect a miracle? Right? Did she know that her son could do something like poof, you know, and bam, there's water? Uh, one view is that she did not, Mary did not expect a miracle. She just, the first person she turned to was her son. The, the dad was dead. Okay, Joseph passed away uh, at a young age. And, you know, Jesus being the carpenter, we're assuming he was Mr. Fix-It. And anything Mary needed, she had other sons, right? And daughters, none of them were, none of them were obedient. Okay, it was only Jesus Christ who was the most perfect son that she had, and so she naturally just kind of went to him and said, "Son, we have no wine. Can you do something?" So that's one view. Another view is that she did know he could perform a miracle. Uh, Lenski argues this, but I don't think it's correct. Uh, he actually says that she knew Jesus was baptized and, he's, and he started his career as the Messiah. And now that he's the Messiah, he can do some miracle for her. I think this guy always goes too far in his, in, in his uh, suggestions. Uh, view number three, the text does not say. And yes, it does not say anything really. Does she know? Does she not know? It doesn't say. Okay. Uh, is there an indication that she might have known that his you know, Messiah being displayed publicly could have been used here. Maybe, maybe not. But my best interpretation will simply be that Jesus never disappointed Mary. And the moment some problem came up, the first person she would just run to is who? Her son. Son, do something. Okay. And up to this day, okay, up to this day, Whatever she asked of Christ, he did. Every command, Jesus obeyed. Now, there was only one instance where he didn't what? Obey. Do you guys remember when they went to Jerusalem, to the temple? He stayed there. They went away for three days. They came back. And they're like, why did you do this to us? And it's, the text says, from that day on, he submitted to them. So... Up to this day, Mary knew if she said something to Christ, he would do something for it. Except this day, he retorted. I don't want to say the retorted. He responded, woman. Now, in our language, that sounds like a derogatory statement, like woman, you know? At that time, it was a very, like a, like a, like something you would say to a woman, you know, in a street, like miss or missus or ma'am. He's being very respectful, but he doesn't call her mom or mother. And I'm sure she was a little bit struck by this, like, uh, excuse me? And he says, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Meaning, you don't decide now what I'm going to do for God's glory. My time, you do not decide what it is. That's what he's, what he's saying to her. He's saying, I've, I'm now going to act as your king, not as your son anymore. It's like a polite way of saying, I don't have to submit to you. You have to submit to what? Me. 
And I think she picked up on this because she told she told the service, do whatever he tells you to what? Do. Okay. MacArthur again says the expression was a polite but not an intimate form of address. It's like let, calling your mom, hey, miss. You know, Miss Sandoval. Can you imagine if Abraham called you that? You're like, excuse me? You call me mama for the rest of your life now. Okay. Um, what have I to do with you? MacArthur says this, and I quote, this is an idiomatic expression which asks rhetorically what the two parties in question have in common and the effect of distancing them. The statement coupled with Jesus' addressing Mary as woman instead of mother politely but firmly informed her that what they had in common in their relationship was no longer to be what it had been while he was growing up. His public ministry had begun and earthly relationships could not determine his action. Meaning, and I quote, Mary was to relate to him no longer as a son, but as her Messiah, the Son of God, her Savior. Now, I believe Mary knew this day would come. I don't think she thought it was going to be on that what? That day of all places at someone else's wedding. And she walks up to him, son, we have no more wine. And he said, no, you cannot command me anymore in what to do. That is amazing. So what is the purpose of John 2? That is the purpose of John 2. He's breaking his relationship with his mom, now as the son of God, as her Lord. And he's now going to perform his first miracle that authenticates that he was sent by what? Sent by God. And it just happens to be at the same time that Mary asks for help. And, and this is the grace of God. He allows this miracle to take place and save this wedding. So here are the several purposes of John 2. Number one, to clearly break the mother-son relationship with Mary. Okay. Now, did Jesus love Mary until the very end? Yes. Turn with me to John 19. And I want to make this clear that Jesus did not just leave her behind and just treat her as just a stranger. He always respected and honored her as the physical human mother over him. In John chapter 19, verse 26, on the cross, okay, he's hanging on the cross. He's suffering on the cross and he still wants to provide for his own mom. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, again, he doesn't address her as mom, but he said, behold, your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. I don't know if you guys remember the messages from John a couple years back, but when he said this, it made it clear, okay? that Jesus will not entrust his mom, who is a believer, to unbelievers. Remember, Jesus had other siblings, right? It wasn't that his younger brothers and sisters didn't want to take care of their own mom. It was that they did not believe in Christ and were not saved yet. Now, they were going to be saved later. We know that. All of them came to faith in Christ. But at that moment, he could not entrust his mom, even though in the future they would have been saved. Jesus at that moment said to John, you're the only believer I can trust. I will not give my mom to anyone else. You are, you are his son now. You need to take care of her. And John received her. It's a huge, huge reminder to us that only believers can take care of other believers. An unbeliever cannot minister and, and take care of a believer. Now, a believer, I believe, can benefit an unbeliever for sure because we have the love of Christ in us. But we ought never to think that, that an unbeliever, even if, there's a, if they're all their own children, should, should be entrusted to the care because a believer knows how to care for another what? Believer. 
So Jesus still loved her and cared for her. But going back to John 2, he no longer uh, had to submit to her as a son any, anymore. Second, what we learn from John 2 is Jesus loves weddings. He loves weddings, guys. Okay? Think about it. The first miracle that he does as the Son of God is at a wedding. The king of the universe attends a small, humble wedding where the wine would run out. Okay? They're poor. We have no idea who the couple is. If they were important to the family, if they were some people that Jesus really loved and whatnot, it was just some stranger in the text, at least for us. But to Christ, it doesn't matter. They're getting married. They're out of wine, and I will bring it. It's like his wedding gift to them. It's insane just thinking about God honoring a wedding on earth. With whatever celebration they had, with the dancing, with the you know, flute music, and the folk dancing, or whatever, he was there participating in the wedding. Why? Who brought these two together? Think about it. He, he's attending a stranger's wedding? Turn with me to Matthew 19. <laughs> he's attending a wedding that he brought about in this couple's lives. You know, my wife and I celebrated our 15th year anniversary with, with Nico's hamburger truck. <laughs> it's really good. Chili cheeseburger. If Jesus came to our wedding, I would be so thrilled. Right? Because it's affirming he's the one who brought us together, you know, as husband and wife. In John, um, uh, Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 3, and some of the Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and what? Female. Now, we read that and think it's just literally creating a male biologically and a female. Look, what Jesus is saying is this. He made male and female, and that was the first day of marriage in the garden. That was a wedding. That's why he says in verse 5, For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. They had no father and mother. But the Lord performs this wedding in the Garden of Eden and pronounces, you shall leave your father and what? Mother. Because this wedding blessing and command was for all the ages to come. Every marriage is the children leaving their mother and father, their blood ties, and becoming closer to his wife and to the husband more than their own family or their own relatives and their, and their parents. The Bible never says that parents and children are one flesh. It only says that about the husband and the what? The wife. You know, I don't remember um, how this came up in our Wednesday uh, WBSA, but eventually one of our discussion as we're talking about certain things, oh, about, you know, um, a man after God's own heart, and, and one example of a a husband being a man after God's own heart would be to love his wife. Because when couples have children, they might not necessarily like each other, but they naturally start loving their what? Children. You know, they do everything for their children. And, I, and I've heard some statistics that when parents who don't like each other uh, have their kids grow up and they leave, they split up. They were together only for that child. And the Bible never says parents love your children. I, or I'm still looking for that verse. Because it's assumed that it's naturally going to happen. We just love the one that we bore. They're from our, you know. But what often happens is the husband stops loving his wife. And that's why the command is given. And here, it's 
you become one flesh, literally one, with your wife, you're not even that close to your own parents. So that's why a husband must love his wife first, and the wife must love her husband first. But look what it says in verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Look at the verb there and the subject. What God has joined. That means every marriage in the world, from the beginning of time to the end of time, every marriage, even the ones done in Las Vegas, while the couples are drunk, okay, it's God's sovereign plan for them to actually be what? Married. If you're asking, did I pick the wrong person? And, 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 and see, if you want to answer that question, the question you have to ask is, are you married now? If the answer is no, yes, you picked the wrong person. But if you're married, you have no choice but to claim that you did pick the right person. Meaning, once you're married, it is God's will that was finished. Okay? Whether it was a mistake or not, you are one, and in God's eyes, you must not be what? Separated. Okay? That's why divorce is ultimately not allowed. Okay? There's no option of divorce. Okay? Now, divorce occurs because sometimes it just has to happen. Like the spouse continually you know, sinning is sinning with that other person and will not stop. You have to separate. That's what the Bible says. You see what I'm saying? It's not that you're condoning it. It's just that's just has to be. And the Bible does allow in those cases to have a separation. Because if you're a believer and you're a, or your spouse, well, whether they're believers or not, and they're continually joining themselves with someone else, what can you do but to break out of that? It's not your fault. It's that it's the other spouse's fault there. And that's what this is talking about, what it says in verse um, 7. Because they said to him, then, why then did Moses give her a certificate of, of divorce and send her away? The Pharisees are saying, hey, Moses gave a certificate of divorce. He allowed this to happen. And you're saying you should never get divorced? Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it, was not, it has not been this, this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, he commits adultery. So again, that's what Jesus is saying. It's not that Moses is saying, okay, let's get a divorce. It's one of the party in that marriage won't stop what? Sinning. So there must be a legal transaction that says, fine, you are now separated from that man who's sinning or that woman who's sinning. And you're free to go your way. Okay? Now, going back to Matt, uh, John chapter 2. Amazing, right? Whoever this couple was, the God of the universe brought these two together. I mean, we can kind of, you know, do, look, like, do a little you know, story in our mind. There's these two kids. You know, they're falling in love with each other. And God is blessing them, bringing them together. And their families get together. And now Jesus, the, the very God who brought these two, whoever they are, he attends their what? Wedding. And brings. And he knows it's going to run out of wine. And so he decides, I will go and give and perform a miracle uh, here. And this leads us to our third um, uh, principle. He loves all marriages. And number three, he respects all marriage customs on earth. Whether it be in the tribe where you have to cut off the head of a, of a snake and offer it to your wife and you have to pour that blood out on her. <laughs> Whatever custom, okay, God respects all marriage customs except for the polygamy part. And that's a whole other subject to talk about. Uh, what happens when the guy becomes a Christian? Which wife does he take? 
you know, things like that. But fourthly, to, okay, the reason for this miracle is to also show the disciples that Jesus Christ is the very God who created the world in six days. What is the first miracle? He creates wine out of what? Water. Okay, for all we know, he could have just created wine instantly in the pot without any water, but he changes water into wine. What is this detail about? It's the demonstration that Jesus is the very God of Genesis chapter 1. He creates anything he wants. He has the power to do so. And it, it tastes really good. Um, by the way, this vat of water held about 120 to 180 gallons. Um, and he turned that into a perfectly, you know, fermented uh, drink. Now, here's an insight. With that much wine and that much drinking all day, you would expect everyone to get drunk. But no one got drunk. What does that say about the alcohol content of this drink? It wasn't that strong. Okay? I don't think Jesus would have ever stayed there if people began to get drunk. Because drunkenness is forbidden in the scripture. We know that. They would have started to sin and do all kinds of things like this. So to me, the wine that they drank here was something similar to our fruit punches that taste really good, but not as fermented to the point where it will cause inebriation or any kind of drunkenness. Do you not agree with that? Everyone thinks this is like the wine that people drink today. Okay, I don't. You tell me how much cups of wine do you have to drink today to feel drunk? Two, three. Okay. But imagine drinking the same thing all day, 180 gallons worth. Okay, this is not the kind where you have to have punch bowl right, at those parties, right? So just just like four gallons. This is 120 people are drinking. They're dancing around drinking. Nobody gets drunk. Which means this is not the wine that we're thinking of in, to, in today's culture. And lastly, number five, Jesus desires to manifest his glory only to those whom he had chosen. Again, it says at the end, the disciples believed in him. Okay. And by the way, turn to chapter 20, John 20. John chapter 20. And look at verse 30. The miracles that Jesus performed was not to just perform before people, just, you know, to, to strangers. It was done so that those whom he chose would believe. Verse 30 says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Okay, So that you may believe. So miracles are for the faith of those who would believe, and it was primarily done for the disciples. The people, they had no idea what happened, whether it's a miracle or not. The servants knew something happened, but they're not following Christ. Okay, Mary saw this, and I'm sure she believed, but it was for the sake of the disciples. Okay, Okay. so now the question is this. So can we use John 2 to justify drinking? No, there's no way you can take that passage and say, Jesus drank during a wedding, so we can also drink what? Two. So if whatever wine you bring, okay, and you could drink tons of it without getting drunk, then okay, I will, I will take that. But that's not that's not the wine that we're, you know, referring to. Uh, maybe kombucha, okay? You can use that instead. Um, but you get the idea. You cannot use John 2. That's the point. We looked at the text. The purpose of the text is not, hey, for a wedding, you know, it's their custom since they drank, we should drink too. Well, first of all, it's not a Jewish wedding that we're doing, okay? It's just 
whatever uh, in, in our culture, uh, whatever culture that we're part of, yeah, the Lord will respect that. But here, clearly, it was not meant to be uh, copied for all, all, culture, all cultures in the future. All right, now let's just look at some other passages now. We're going to wrap this up. Look, turn with me to Titus chapter 2, verse 3. And I'm going to give you some brief um, verses and, and, and try to wrap this up. And maybe you do one more lesson next week. And, and I think by that time, it will be very clear. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So there it is. Older women must not be enslaved to much wine. Now, when I read this as a young man, I never thought women drank. I don't know why. I grew up never thinking women ever drank. It was just the guys. But now I realize a lot of women drink. Housewives especially. My wife was telling me that on Instagram, there's a lot of housewives posting that it's always with a cup of wine, a wine a day. It's drinking, you know, and it relaxes them and they, 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 they flaunt this. The text says, if you're an older woman, as an example, you are not to be known as someone enslaved to wine. Turn to Isaiah 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Leadership should never drink. Okay? Leaders. Uh, look at Isaiah 28 verse 7. And he's talking about Israel's priest here. It says, They also reel with wine, and stagger from strong drink. Now notice the comparison. There's wine, and then there's the really strong stuff. So even at that time, they had a difference of, of, of alcohol content in these drinks. They were getting drunk with wine, and they were getting drunk with strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They stagger from strong drink. They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering a verdict. What does that mean? They can't make proper decisions. This is a warning to Israel not to drink, especially their leadership, because they cannot rule. Now look at Proverbs 31. Now this is very interesting because what about kings? Because when we see movies about kings, they're always flaunting their power, their authority. When you read about um, 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 Esther and she's serving King Ahasuerus, he's throwing a drinking party for like seven days, 30 days. And it's all, every king of the world will demonstrate his power by providing uh, drunkenness for everyone who's partying with them. But look at Proverbs 31. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. Okay, the mom is telling her son, who is a king, it is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. Is there a prohibition in the scripture about drinking? Here it is. But it's for leaders, for kings. Why? They have to rule. And the mom, even at that time, they all know the moment you start drinking, you'll get addicted and you'll start losing self-what? Control. And by the way, turn to Leviticus chapter 10. Now again, yes, you might say, okay, fine. This is a command. Isn't it for Old Testament kings? Okay, fine. Yes, you can say that. What about Leviticus? Isn't this for the priest at that time? Okay, you can say that, but let's read it together. And, and notice the severity of the prohibition. Now, it doesn't say everyone needs to stop, but for those in leadership. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9. It says, do not drink wine or strong drink. Again, do you see the comparison there? Wine would be more of like a daily 
drink that had some alcohol, but not that strong. But then there was also that, you know, really strong stuff, the vodka of that day. He says to Aaron, they were priests. You shall not drink wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons with you when you come into the tent of meeting, so that you will not die. Because what just happened in verse 1? Nadab and Abayu burned strange what? Fire. A fire that was not permitted in the Old Testament. Most likely they were drunk. And God instantly killed them. And look at verse... Um, uh, look at Numbers, uh, turn to number 6. Numbers, the next book over. Leviticus and then Numbers. Numbers chapter 6. There's a, there's a, um, there's a, like a ceremony for someone who really wants to devote himself to God. He would be called a Nazarite. And he would take this vow called a Nazarite vow. And one of the vows that he must keep as he devotes himself to God, is drinking. Look at verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. It says, He shall abstain as a Nazarite from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no, not even vinegar. And when I read that, I was thinking, oh man, does this include apple cider vinegar? Okay. Whether made from wine or strong drink, nor shall he drink any grape juice. Because they all knew, remember, they didn't have refrigeration. You squeeze the juice out of grapes and you let it sit. It starts what? Fermenting. So you can't even drink grape juice, nor eat fresh or dried grapes. Nothing. Why? They all knew the dangers of alcohol. Now, this one was more of like a spiritual commitment. Right? It wasn't that the uh, grave would cause him to sin. It was a symbol that I, as one devoted to God, will never be and eat from anything that causes me to lose self what? The self control. Now, I would argue from this text that's how severe we should take it. Do you understand? If a Nazarite would not even eat grape, and it's not even fermented yet, but the source of alcohol is eventually can be traced back to a grape. He would even be told, don't take it as a vow for that Nazarite vow. It was only for a, I forgot how many days, but he would resist. As a symbol, I am devoted to God, which corresponds to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, Turn to Proverbs 20. There's a few more and then we'll close. Proverbs 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Notice, he's saying, don't get drunk. And notice also, it always includes both the wine, which is more of like a drink, and strong drink. The Bible actually commends or commands that we give wine to someone. Turn to Proverbs 31. There's a person that we are commanded to give wine to. <laughs> okay? So, it says here, Proverbs 31, 6, Give strong drink to him who is what? Perishing. And wine to him whose life is bitter. Now, obviously you guys know that this is not an actual command. It's a it's a poetic, sage-like saying that those who are suffering, those who are depressed, those who are at the end of their life, and their life is bitter. You guys understand? Like they, It's like there's nothing that might comfort him except just to numb their what? Numb their pain. Okay? It, it's, a, it's a colloquial way of saying this 
strong drink really has no other use for then someone who's like about to go to hell and you want to ease his pain. So again, it's not, you know, it's just, you know, being facetious. It's not an actual command. Oh, you're, 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 you're dying. You're, you're bitter. Here, let me buy you some vodka. Now drink up so you can forget everything. No. Okay. But it's just a way of saying if there was a use for drinking, it would be in this kind of situation. Well, there's no hope, there's no purpose, there's just death, you know. And and it's also saying that wine and strong a strong drink is strong enough to cause him to forget all of that. And lastly, Isaiah 5:22. Turn with me to Isaiah 5, verse 22. And I hope after you read this, you will never applaud anyone for drinking. Okay? Isaiah 5.22, it says, Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong what? Drink. Isn't that interesting? Even at that time, people would boast about holding their liquor. Someone could drink a lot without losing control. And Bible condemns them. Okay, if you ever see that happening, do not go. Whoa! He drank a whole barrel of alcohol. And he's still able to walk. It says, "Whoa!" The word "whoa" means you will receive God's judgment. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men and mixing strong drink. So now. The rest of the stuff I have here, actually, we're done. Um, I had some st more statistics about, you know, drinking, carcinogen, 10%, uh, disease control, binge drinking, how many thousands of people have died. And I think we can skip all that. Well, according to one study, of the 490 million people in the European Union, more than 23 million are dependent on alcohol a lot 30 39 percent of all traffic deaths in 2005 was because of alcohol 40 percent of violent crimes occur under the influence of what alcohol anyways i think you guys get the point okay does the scripture clearly clearly uh in, you know, admonish you never to drink if possible yes okay if you were living at that time and the water was dirty, fine. You know, we'll put a little bit in. Okay, but we're living in a time where even sink water is clean enough to drink without dying. That we live in a culture where that is not, you know, those kinds of things are not necessary. I want to encourage you to really think through this. Okay. At the same time, knowing that it is not sin to drink, but there's really no reason because we desire to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our study. Thank you for teaching us these things. We try to look at all the passages concerning this. There was a few more, but uh, we're going to move on. Uh, but we see clearly now, Lord, that whether it be a New Testament principle or Old Testament principle, uh, alcohol has a way of pulling someone away from being controlled by the Spirit of God. And we desire not to ever have someone, someone or anything control us except your word and the spirit of God within us. Father, help us to grow in maturity um, and in sanctification. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.